Hi, I'm Janine and my channel is Janine Sews. In today's video, I'm first going to share with you a jacket that I made and I used your suggestions when I picked the pattern. Then I'm going to tell you about this top, which is the most altered pattern I've ever used in my life. Stick around and I'll show you my makes. In a previous video, I showed you a piece of clearance fabric that I picked up at Fabricland here in Calgary. And it was this stretch faux suede. It's got a tie-dye print and it's got these kind of fish scale perforations. Here, this is the right side up. You can see the perforations that move and it's a super drapey faux suede. I'd never worked with anything like this before. I used faux suede once, just a little bit of it on a vest that I made for my mom. So I had this and originally when I bought it, my plan was to make a jacket and I was thinking of a walking coat. So collarless, very straight, set in sleeves, button placket, no shape at all. But I wasn't sure about that. I figured this is kind of a fun fabric. I may as well try something different with it. So I posed the question on a video. What would you, what pattern would you use for this? And many people came back and suggested either a cardigan or a waterfall type jacket. I made a waterfall jacket a couple of years ago and wasn't very successful in it. So I was hesitant to try that style again. But I figured that you all probably have a pretty good idea, so I thought that I would give that a try. A couple of years ago, the very beginning of the pandemic, I attended an online class to make this pattern. This is Pamela's Patterns Cascade Cartier Blazer. So here's the Cascade version. I think this was one of the first online classes that Pamela Leggett, who's the designer and proprietor of Pamela's Patterns, had uh, first one of her first video classes. It was a really, this was really early on in the pandemic when we were all just dying to have something to do other than sew masks. Cascade Cardi, that's what we decided to make. Sewing the project was actually less challenging than I thought it was going to be, but I did have to do a couple of things a little bit differently. First, this fabric is like suede, so it kind of grabs. So I used the Teflon foot on my machine and a universal needle. I thought about flat felling the seams, but the fabric didn't feed through really well, and I suppose I could have put some tissue paper or something on the bottom side against the feed dogs. But I just in my mind was imagining all kinds of little pieces of tissue paper that I'd have to pull off, so I decided not to do that. For this, I sewed the shoulder tucks and the, let's see here, I showed shoulder, sh for this, I sewed the shoulder tucks and the shoulder seams, regular stitch on my sewing machine. I used bias tape. To stabilize the shoulder seams. I sewed the sleeves and the side seams on the serger and it does not show badly at all. So there's the serge seam. Had to be careful to stitch in the right direction otherwise the little perforations would pop open if they got caught underneath a feed dog or a foot or something. When it came time to do really the feature sewing on this which is the front hem, the hem that goes all the way around. All of the edges are hemmed. The pattern calls for one inch double-sided clear hem tape. And I had that. And clear was, of course, perfect because it doesn't show through at all. So this is the installed hem tape on the edge. First, you'll see that this pressed up perfectly. And this is the wrong side. So this has the one inch clear hem tape on it. And then the pattern called for top stitching an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch from the edge. I kind 
kind of worry about this popping, the um, hem tape popping at some point, especially after it's been washed. So I wound up stitching, I did around a quarter of an inch from the edge, pressed edge, and then I did five eighths of an inch and three quarters of an inch to hold it all down. So this is the wrong side, looks pretty good, and the right side. Then the final thing that you do is the front and back fisheye darts. And because I couldn't really pin this fabric, I wound up using magic clips, looking in the mirror, moving them around, looking in the mirror, and I basted them once only because I didn't want to leave a bunch of marks in the fabric, and then I stitched them. I just want to say that all y'all were right. This is absolutely the right fabric for this style of cardigan or jacket or whatever you want to call it. When I made this the last time, I wasn't happy with it because really the fabric was too bouncy, too, too much body. So I, it didn't, didn't waterfall nicely or anything. And the darts didn't press crisply in the back. That's what bothered me the most. But this, the darts pressed beautifully and it drapes nicely. So excellent choice, folks. I'm gonna be coming to you for more ideas in the future. This top needed all of the alterations. So let me tell you how I came about sewing this because this wasn't on my spring or summer sewing plans. But as I mentioned in the last video, I entered Pattern Review's annual sewing bee. And for round two, the challenge was to sew something that featured buttons. One button had to be functional. So because I don't want to sew anything that's costumey or I'll never wear, I figured I will sew something that kind of fits in the plans to make something that fits me the way I want it to, in the style that I like, and I can wear it to work in the spring and summer. It's also always easier to start with something that you've sewn before. So I pulled out New Look 6808, which I've sewn twice in the past. It's been a few years. I don't have either version anymore for a couple of reasons I'll go into. So I picked out this pattern, ran over to the local little fabric store. I bought myself some muslin because I was gonna do a proper toile. And I picked up this fabric, which is a 100% cotton bark cloth. I love bark cloth. I've been lusting over it for a couple of years. And I picked this because I thought it was pretty, but more importantly, it wasn't blue because everything I make seems to be blue. So I thought this was kind of a nice change and it would go with cream trousers and gray trousers and skirts and things like that. So I came home, I started working on my toile. When I made this the last time, I had done an FBA and that was the only thing I had done to the pattern. So I started with that. I knew that I now need to do a high round back adjustment. So I made that adjustment and I also added a little bit of extra seam allowance to the sides to make up for whatever I have left over from two years of pandemic time around my waist. So I traced everything on to the muslin with those particular alterations. While I was doing that, I decided, you know, I should probably cut the back in two pieces and not on the fold. So I added an extra 5 eighths of an inch and cut the back in two pieces. And I did that for one, well, actually at, the, at that point it was for two reasons. First, I was thinking about adding an actual button placket down the back, but also it's a great way for me to add shape I don't think I actually am short-waisted. I think I've just got a bum that's kind of a shelf. So if I sew on the fold, the fabric kind of pools over my butt. And this way, when I do a two-piece back, I can just add a little bit of shaping, scoot out a little bit more over my bum, and things don't get hung up as well. And I think that worked pretty well for this pattern. So I made those changes. I I, and I even added balance lines. Never do that. So I made all those changes, basted everything together, gave it a try, and immediately noticed something that bothered me about the top the two times I've made it previously. And that was that the upper chest is way too big. 
So, I remembered that I always had bra straps that showed, which drove me a little bit crazy. So I figured out I have to, I have to do something more than just add more fabric here to cover bra straps because the fabric was gaping. So I went looking for some tutorials and wound up with Cashmere's tutorial for a gaping front neckline. And the link is down below. So I did that. I cut into the muslin fabric and I wound up taking out two and a half inches around the front neckline to get rid of the gaping. And when you do that, you wind up rotating that into the side bust darts. So the bust darts are a little bit bigger, but you get rid of some of the fabric here. What a slick adjustment. It's something you certainly can't do if you're making a wearable toile, but on a muslin, it works really well. Now, because I did that, I had changed the shape of the front neckline slightly. So I pulled out a French curve and evened it all out. But then I also had to make the adjustments to the shape of the collar and the front facing. So I did those. And then I also had to figure out where the front and back fisheye darts go. And of course, I love fisheye darts because they add shaping where I want shaping to be added. Kind of adding, showing the shape in my bust and my back instead of things just hanging straight down. So I moved those where I thought that they should be. And then I was ready to cut out the fashion fabric. Now it was time to start thinking about buttonholes. I have sewn plenty of buttonholes on my machine and I once went to a class where I learned how to hand sew buttonholes, but I knew that I wasn't gonna get a great result with this and I really wanted something that was going to kind of stretch me where I was gonna learn something new. So I went out and learned all that I could about bound buttonholes. I looked at some books, I looked at a bunch of tutorials, I made a bunch of sample buttonholes. I've still gotten them around somewhere. In the end, I found one tutorial that I thought was super helpful and it gave me the best results. And that was Jana Prey's from Islander Sewing. Again, the link is down below. Jana Prey, if, you, if you're not familiar with her, she is the queen of efficient sewing. So she teaches methods where you can do things in the order that they should be done so that you're sewing the most efficiently and sewing things quickly. But she's very well known for taking some shortcuts like not pinning things. So what was really interesting about the video on buttonholes is she said you cannot take shortcuts with this. You can't cut out steps. You must mark your fabric properly based where you want all the buttonholes and everything aligned properly. So if the queen of shortcuts says don't take shortcuts, I finally took it seriously <laughs> because I had been taking shortcuts in my other samples. So I used Janet Prey's methods from her tutorial to do the faux buttonholes on the back. Now the buttonholes actually work. It's just they don't open or close anything. The buttons go through them. It's just not, it's fun, they're functional, but they have no purpose. I like that the ribbon is a pop of different colors so you can really see where the buttonholes are. I used nice big buttons and I didn't use interfacing on the back placket. I just used silk organza because I didn't want the placket to stick out and be too stiff. I wanted it to very gently follow the curves that I'd added when I did the back seam where I added some curve for my back. So, I think you can see that it's a very soft, unstructured kind of placket, which is exactly what I wanted. So I got that done, but part of the brief for the sewing bee was you had to have at least one functional button. Man, I really debated that for a long time. Should I add a button in the collar? Should I make the collar two pieces as a flap over it? Should I make it function so I can put a ribbon in it? Or I even thought about doing two little buttonholes so I could put a brooch on there. No, I didn't like that idea. So I decided to just add a pocket to the front. So uh, someone somewhere in the discussion about the contest had mentioned that there were really great machine embroidered 
buttonholes out there. So I went looking and oh yes, there are beautiful designs for machine embroidered and but buttons. Some of them are very elegant. Some of them are fun, floral, utilitarian, everything. So if you have a machine that embroiders with the embroidery module, take a look because there is some terrific stuff out there that just adds something special. So I embroidered what turns out to be a very monochromatic design on the pocket, which was just fine. It's just a little floral thing. But the buttonhole that the machine embroidery module did is absolutely perfect. Boy, it's a gorgeous, tight, completely even buttonhole. So you can bet I'll be using machine embroidered buttonholes a lot more in the future. So I stitched that on. I was absolutely thrilled that I kind of eyeballed the fabric when I cut out the pocket. It matches perfectly. Best pattern matching I've ever done. And I just kind of looked at it, glanced at it, and by that point I was so tired of working on this project I didn't even care if it matched and it matches perfectly. So maybe that's what I need to do in the future is just not care and then things will work out perfectly. So the sewing bee, although this wasn't what I planned to make, I wound up ticking off a couple of my boxes for 2022, which is work on fitting. Absolutely not where I need to be, but it was a step forward. Learned a lot of new things. And I've had welt pockets on my list for probably three years now. I think I'm a little closer to understanding how a welt pocket works because I know how to do a bound buttonhole. And I believe there's some similarities there. I could be wrong, but I think there are some similarities there. So even though it wasn't what I had planned, and I do try to stick a little bit to my plan, this wound up being something that I'm very pleased to have in my wardrobe. So this is New Look 6808, adjusted a fair bit, but I think that it fits my plan because it's got the nice shaping and uh, it's, it's something I will certainly use again. The sewing bee kind of threw um, a wrench into my plans for my spring sewing, but I'm back on track now that I've made that jacket and I'm gonna make a couple of tops this week. Where we are, the days, we're, we're pretty far north, so the days are getting longer really quickly. The sun doesn't go down until nine o'clock now and all of my sewing evenings, I'm afraid, are gonna start to disappear into gardening in a bit. I've got not a lot of garden work to do, a little bit. We have a teeny tiny yard, but I do wanna fix it up a little bit. And I gotta get outside and walk and do a few things like that. So I have to be a lot better organized with my sewing, so not getting off track. But of course I did get off track and I went to a charity sale on the weekend and bought 14 patterns, no, 16 patterns, and two pieces of fabric. 12 of the patterns are vintage Vogue. I will likely never make. I'll show those to you in a future video because I will bet you some of you who have been sewing longer than I have, have made them up before. So that's what I have for you today. I hope you are really well. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. I'll see you soon.